Good evening. And before we begin tonight's uh, presentation, uh, Joanne was so good about being able to find a copy of this. Remember I spoke about it last week for Good Friday, the Recolta. <clears throat> the Recolta was a book of indulgence prayers issued by the popes from a period from 18, okay, 1807 uh, to 1950. In 1968, it was replaced by another text that actually is smaller, would be smaller than this. The name Recolta means collection. This is a collection of indulgenced prayers from that span of time that I just mentioned from the popes. Um, there's a, it's a longer title to it, but we'll just use the word Recolta for it. <clears throat> in the t it's an Italian word, it's an Italian title, but the prayers were all written in Latin to the Recolta. Now, in here you, you have some that are Latin prayers and then there have been, the tr been translations. I'll sh let, pass it around and let, let you look at it. What the, where the paper is marked, those are the ones that I marked for the ones that were referred to to the Blessed Mother for Good Friday. So just where you, you can see what, they, what it is and what they are. In 1968, it was replaced by another text, and I'm going to see if I can do it without looking at the back cover of that book. I'm not quite sure if that's the word, but the other word is I'm going to have to look when I get the book back to be sure that those words are correct. It was replaced by this text, two Latin words, of course, indulgence, you would see right there. It was a small, it's a, it's a smaller text with fewer prayers, and it is a title entitled Indulgenced Actions that the Popes approved and sanctioned, as I said, starting in 1968. <clears throat> so this text that you're looking at is, you know, has been, well, you can say been replaced, but um, it's the, this was the older text that was used prior to that. <clears throat> There's really nothing really much more for me to say about it than that. Uh, and actually, if you looked at the back cover of the book, you could read the same thing that I just said. And you might, you'll also get the correct spelling of that, because remember, I'm doing that from memory without looking at it. So I could, be, I could have misspelled the words. But you get the idea. Okay. While you're looking at that, we will begin tonight's uh, tonight's presentation, and then there will be a little bit of a sequel at the end that relates to something I spoke about earlier. But tonight, we begin with, <clears throat> we talk about Holy Saturday and the Easter Vigil. And it's important to probably note that we don't want to just lump Holy Saturday and the Easter Vigil in together. They are meant to be distinct. The Easter Vigil really begins at the conclusion of Holy Saturday. So what actually is Holy Saturday? The Saturday of Holy Week <clears throat> is known as Holy Saturday. It's sometimes called the Saturday of Light. It immediately follows Good Friday and is the day set aside during Lent when Christians prepare for Easter. <clears throat> the day is meant to commemorate the day that Jesus was placed in the tomb. So. It really, one of the things you first pick up right away would be, it's going to be a day that is intended to be quiet. Now when I say quiet, what I mean is, well, yeah, you could probably be quiet in your homes, but it's quiet as far as the church is concerned. No mass is celebrated. It really cannot be celebrated. It'd have to be a very, very, very extraordinary situation for that to occur. Nothing really takes place. 
everything is intended to be quiet to really put ourselves in the disposition, the mood, preparing for what is to come. So in this book, it refers to Holy Saturday as being a day when nothing happens, but yet everything happens. And the everything is that we believe in that period of time from Good Friday when Jesus dies on the cross and he's buried till the time when we go to the Easter Vigil that by our, by our own profession of faith we say he descended into hell. He descended into lower regions where he brought back all people who had lived just and holy and good lives and brought them back so that they would now be able to, to enter eternity in heaven. They remember they were not allowed to after the sin of Adam. So all of those folks then Jesus went to redeem and bring into heaven. Some icons will depict him particularly bringing out Adam and Eve and under his feet there will be chains that were broken that symbolize the chains that they would have been held prisoner to up until that time that he descends into hell and redeems them. So as we pray, he descended into hell, then we go into the third day he rose. We'll go to that in a moment. So this is what this period of time is meant to really commemorate, but nothing is really celebrated. There's nothing done by way of any liturgy that states that. It's just what we, we come to believe by way of our faith. So Holy Saturday is just that. You can read the rest about what Holy Saturday is in here. I'm not going to go and read it word for word to you, but it basically prepares us for what is said in an ancient homily for Holy Saturday. Something strange is happening. There is a great silence on earth today. So that and then <clears throat> what it then leads to is Further in that homily, when Jesus does go to those lower regions, when he does redeem the just, he, his, the words are, rise, let us leave this place. I will enthrone you in heaven. So that is the, prom that is the promise then that Jesus gives to those who are just when he frees them from captivity in hell and will now take them to the place that they rightfully it is rightfully prepared for them. So, so as I said, Holy Saturday lasts all day until 6 p.m. or dusk, whichever would come first. Mostly where we live, where we are, it would be dusk. So, when you sometimes, when you celebrate Easter, like at the end of March, Dusk can be earlier than 7.30. When you celebrate Easter later, you even run the risk of it being later than 7.30, but really most celebrations really begin at 7.30. Otherwise, you're playing with minutes and everything and trying to make everything work out. So that's what you're dealing with when you talk about the span of time in which, you, in which Holy Saturday will last. And what it leads to is the Paschal Mystery of Christ. It's celebrated on that night, the, so it is considered to be a vigil, and when, most of the time when you think of a vigil, a vigil is in terms of what are we waiting for? Not with this one. The vigil is who are we waiting for? And we're waiting for Christ to rise. We celebrate then his resurrection and Today, of course, we're not going to be celebrating as like the first one. We are going to be celebrating it more through symbolism. So the celebration of this vigil relates to the resurrection of the Lord, and it also relates to the sacraments of initiation. I'll get to that in a few minutes. What I want to focus on at this point is that is the following. The vigil mass can begin any time before midnight. Then it's the vigil, <clears throat> and it's considered to anyone who part 
participates in it, can celebrate, can re, participates in the vigil mass, may receive, can receive communion that night, and may also receive communion again the following morning on Easter Sunday. That's one of those rare times when you can receive communion more than once in a given period of time. So it's important to remember, to remember that. The Easter Vigil, and we're going to go back to the Office of Readings that I've mentioned in the previous two weeks, where the Office of Readings, uh, no, excuse me, where the liturgy for the evening of Holy Thursday and the liturgy for the evening of Good Friday replaced Vespers or the evening prayer of the Liturgy of the Hours. Anyone who participated in that did not have to pray the Liturgy of the Hours. When it comes to the Easter Vigil, you, the, the, all the Liturgy of the Hours for Holy Saturday are prayed. What isn't prayed is night prayer and the Office of Readings. It goes right into morning prayer on Easter Sunday. So those are just a couple of things when we come to the celebration of the Liturgy of the Hours. Now, at this point we come down to what are really the major parts of the Easter Vigil. And in the text that you have, the books that you have, it refers to it really like the works of a symphony. And that's a real good description to use for it. Because when you're looking at it like that, you're seeing it as a complete, seeing it completely. You're not breaking it up into one, two, three, four. So if you're keeping that in mind, then the first movement of that symphony is going to be, if I give it to you in these simple terms, it's the service of light. It also has another name that is called the Lucinarium. And all that means is light ceremony. So it begins with the service of light. And I'm sure probably most of you folks probably have attended the Easter Vigil. That you come in, the church is dark. Everything is intended to be dark. So you come in, we just leave minimal lights on so nobody gets hurt. And we start here, we start in the vestibule, the front of the, where the front of the church is. We will, there will be a fire out there that is started. The fire is blessed. After the fire is blessed, then <clears throat> there are prayers that are prayed for the candle. So that really, when, and the prayers, the various prayers that are prayed have to do with the cross and the numerals but particularly with the cross, also to note that you have here five wax nails that are in the cross that really will all symbolize the wounds of Christ. Two in the hands, two in the feet, and of course the side. So those nails are then set in to this cross as prayers, as the priest prays particular prayers. He also trace, will trace the numerals to it. With the, um, <clears throat> on, the, on the candle. Once all of that is done, then he will say something similar to the words, may the light of Christ then rise in our hearts. I don't have the exact words right down in front of me at the moment. But at that point, then the candle is lit, which is the symbolism for Christ has risen. So before anything else, that is done. It's done in, done in the vestibule. Then we'll walk the candle into the church and raise it. And then either the priest or the deacon, who's ever carrying the cross, because with the candle, excuse me, uh, will, will say, Christ our light. And then everyone will respond, thanks be to God. At that point, there are very few candles, other candles lit in the church. It's primary. That's the primary focus. But then as we proceed to come into the church, then more of the candles are lit. Listen by all of the ministers who participate in this church because of the cruciform design that it has. It'll probably be 
all of this area of the church since we're walking by these people. And when we then come up here, and which in other churches would be halfway down the aisle, once again that candle is raised, and once again it is said, Christ our light, thanks be to God. The third time, we would make it then all the way in. So naturally where this candlestick is tonight, it's not going to be there on the Easter Vigil. It's going to be back there near the Ambo. And we'd walk it over there, but in the meantime, we would light the rest of the candles in church so that by the time that that candle reaches that candlestick over there, all candle, there should be all candlelight in the church. And the third time it's proclaimed, Christ our light, thanks be to God. So it's the whole idea of Christ rising and more and more, you know, that light fills the darkness. And that is the light then that overcomes the darkness. So the symbol of the risen Christ overcoming the darkness of sin and death. Once that is done, <clears throat> then by the time we reach, go over there, some incense will be put in a thurible because we've, we've processed that in. The candle would be incensed in that that's respect and symbol of the risen Christ. Following that incensation, you then have a proclamation that is made in this service of light. We re can re refer to it as the Easter proclamation. But it has become more commonly known by the Latin word that introduces it called the exultet. Which really is referring to that he is risen, or proclaiming this. So this is proclaimed, usually chanted, sung. So that can be sung by, I mean, usually sung by the priest or deacon. It, however, you can have occasions where you may have a cantor who will do that. And <clears throat> we, everybody remains in the church with the lighted candles while the exultet is proclaimed. Once that concludes, all the candles would be extinguished. The one thing that you'll notice that usually while, just as the, the, <clears throat> this is going to take place, the lights are then turned on in the church. So, I mean, for one very, I mean, it's also going to be for somewhat of a practical reason, too, because, you know, if you then suddenly you blow the candle out and you forget to put the lights on, what are you doing? You've got darkness, and you're really going kind of, you're kind of contradicting what this whole part of this, of this service has just been trying to do. So you make sure that you have, then eventually have as much light as possible to really be emphasizing the presence of light at that point. So this is the service of light. When, after the exalted has been proclaimed, this part really is done. And it flows into the next part that has an introduction to it because it's now mentioning that you know, Lent is over, Easter is, we're, we're celebrating our Lord's resurrection. So the liturgy of the word is introduced, and then as many as seven readings from the Old Testament can be read. So the maximum number of readings from the Old Testament, because it, <clears throat> I'll just put this here, I'm just going to read it. The maximum is seven. It can be as few as two or three. We've used three. What it is, after the priest introduces the liturgy of the word, the reading takes place. So you have a cycle here. You have a reading. After the reading, you have a responsorial psalm, and following the responsorial psalm, you have a prayer. 
And that's repeated as many times as for, what, for the readings that you have. <clears throat> when you get to the final reading and you're doing the final prayer, at that point, then you have the Gloria proclaimed. Now, we mentioned the Gloria one other time as I was doing this. Remember when that was? Holy Thursday. What happens when the Gloria is sung on Holy Thursday? There's another action that's taking place. No one? Bells. The bells. The bells are rung. What happens after the bells are rung at the Gloria on Holy Thursday? They're silenced. They don't appear, they do not come back again until the Gloria is proclaimed at the Easter Vigil. So, you now have this spirit of celebration and exuberance, I mean, that is occurring here. The glory is proclaimed, or sung, I should say. Following that, you then will have a prayer, and then you will have the reading of the New Testament, or the epistle reading that will take place. So, <clears throat> this is where, now, like I said, the, New Te the reading from the New Testament. Following that reading, of the epistle, you will then have a gospel acclamation that's a little more than what your average gospel acclamation, or usual gospel acclamation is. What's the one word we don't use, haven't used in Lent and that we will bring back at Easter? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, the gospel acclamation will be, will be alleluias, there'll be a verse. There'll be alleluias, there'll be a verse. There'll be alleluias, there'll be a verse. We really rev this up. We celebrate this. We should be. So the gospel acclamation, you know, does just that. It's meant to be that celebration of joy. Jesus is risen. There's new life in the world. We've celebrated the light that shines through the darkness. We're, you know, in a spirit of joyful celebration, so this is what we do. Then the gospel is proclaimed, and it will usually be a gospel that is around the resurrection. So, this is the liturgy of the word. Then, of course, it concludes with the homily. Now you've gone into the second movement. So you've gone from light to word, and in the readings from the Old Testament, a lot of that will be em emphasized with creation, uh, the, the covenant, the renewal of the covenant, the, the exodus, I can't forget that. That's, the exodus is the one reading of the Old Testament that always has to be read. With the others, you can, have, you can make choices, but the reading from exodus always has to be read. Why would you think it would? It's, it's a Passover, and in this case, now you're passing over, not like for what, I mean, certainly the reading from Exodus will talk about the Passover from the Egyptians leaving the land of Egypt, going to the Promised Land. Now we're going to be talking about a Passover that's going to take place from sin and death to resurrection and new life. So you're setting the tone in the readings, and that was one particular reading that would be important because it's connecting us. It's connecting us with our past, and, but it's keeping us focused in our present because that past is the foundation for, the, for what we are celebrating here. So it, it, you know, all of this you know, helps to certainly create the mood and create the spirit and keep us in that spirit of what we are celebrating and why. So, the liturgy of the word is very significant and important in the celebration of this liturgy because it's building from this, but preparing us for what's to come. 
And what follows this, just give me a minute to clear some of this board off because I'm running out of room. It then prepares us for the third movement, the Liturgy of Baptism. Is that going to mean we're always going to perform a baptism at the Easter Vigil? The ideal would be you'd like to, but if you don't, does that mean this doesn't take place? Uh-uh. By no means. The I mean, it's, it is good to be able to have candidates for baptism. And we won't this year. We probably will next year. You know, at that time, what would happen is the first thing we have to do before we even celebrate the baptism is what's the most essential matter that we have to use for the celebration of a baptism? Water. Water. And you're not just taking any common water. You've got to, it's got to be blessed. And it's got to be blessed in connection with what we're celebrating here. So the first thing that we're going to do is come over to here, the font. Bless the water. We bless the water. After the water is blessed, and in the liturgy of baptism, then you would take and you would sing, you would proclaim the litany of the saints, which is used in the celebration of every baptism that we celebrate. However, the one that is used here is a little more lengthy, and it can be sung. It's only sung, though, when you have a baptism. So if there's no baptism, there's no litany. Then... <clears throat> Following that, lit uh, following that pro proclamation of the liturgy, then, um, okay, they talk about carrying the Easter candle. I say you carry the Easter candle when you know that's going to be safe to do. Because you know the very practical thing with the Easter candle? You've got it in this holder. You're going to take it out. Once one of the things that can happen the wax can come out and you can get burned. So a lot of times I've not been too much of a fan of moving the Easter candle once it's in the, the holder. So what it would be is that usually you would probably go up to where the candle is because, of course, in the liturgy of baptism, after you baptize the person, you then are giving them a light, similarly the light of Christ that now is very present in this per these pe person or persons who are newly baptized. So they're, ref they're referred to at that point as neophytes because in that word it means new. So they are new in their, you know, in their, in their practice now of their faith. They are new Christians. They are new people. They're, they now have got a new life that they take on. So you give them a symbol of that in that light that comes from the Easter, from that candle. <clears throat> in, then they, they make the promises that are made for, the prom, you know, for made for a baptism. Those promises are also renewed by everyone who is present in this church. So, in the spirit of of that renewal and the spirit of making those baptism promises, once again, we light all the candles that the people have here in church. So, servers will go around, they light all the candles. While all the candles are lit, then we renew the baptism promises. That's done not only at the Easter Vigil, but also on Easter Sunday. So in the place of the creed, we renew baptism promises. Then, okay, we've just got unfinished business with the neophytes that we have to do. Okay. Um, okay, we've, got, we've done that, we've done that. Okay, if it happens to be 
that there were any infants who were baptized in the Easter Vigil. They then are anointed with the Holy Chrism as they would be of any other time for baptism on the crown of their head, and that's going to be the extent of the, the, of the baptism for them. For adults, they would be also receiving another sacrament of initiation. How many sacraments of initiation do we have? Three. And they are? Baptism. Okay. Baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. It's important to keep them in this situ issue and situation in this order. Because with adults, that's the way they receive the sacraments. Baptism, confirmation, Eucharist. Children, we know it can get a little bit turned around. But it's important to remember that that's the order in which those sacraments are received. So before this ceremony ends for anybody being baptized, any adult being baptized, they are going to be confirmed as well. So the Holy Chrism over in that cabinet on the top shelf is what we would be using. That would be for any infant on the crown of their head, any adult on their forehead as they're confirmed. Questions? Yeah, no, we're not we're going to get to that. Okay, now, let me go back. Okay, because you've got to remember, there are things if this, then that with this ceremony. Okay, you have, okay, you then do celebrate the confirmation, but if you do not, if you do not have a confirmation, what then happens? You go right to, okay, you have the blessing of the water. The blessing of the water is done. You renew the baptism promises and the candles. Then you go, customarily it would be to go through the church and sprinkle people with holy water. However, I think there are enough of you who probably know that isn't really what I've done at the Easter vigil. Easter Sunday morning's different because there are no candles involved or anything like that. What I do, and it actually was picked up on by my, the pastor I had here when I was an associate at St. George's who used to always make the comment, and it was really to come up by way of a complaint, how are we going to get those candles out of the pews? Otherwise, there's going to be wax all over the place. Yes, Monsignor, okay, we'll see what we can do about this. And finally, I said, we're going to do something. He complains about this every year. So I said to him, how about if we do this? I said, how about if we don't sprinkle them? And we come down and we bring down a vessel of water and put it here. Have the people come up. Bring the candle with them. And we'll put servers with baskets on either side. They can come up, make the sign of the cross on the forehead of the person behind them, and drop the candle in the basket as they go back to the pew. He loved that idea. So, guess what? <laughs> I've that practice I've used ever since. Because it gets the candles out of the pews, the people come up, they actually can get a chance to move too. Because you know, you figure, you know, Easter Vigil, you know, by the time you're getting to all of this, it's a good hour that can go by. Well, sit in those pews for an hour. You're, you're doing it right now. <laughs> I mean, you know, so I just encourage, we do a little movement. We get people up. They do the sign of the cross. They, you know, do, trace the sign of the cross in each other's forehead with the holy water. They go back. They put the candles in the basket. They go back to their seat. Okay, great. We're all done. At that point, we have now complete, complete, completed this. We've completed the liturgy of baptism. So just to keep in mind, it pertains to us all whether we're new and being received into the church that night or whether we are renewing our baptism promises. So when you're looking at this, it isn't, well, this doesn't pertain to me. No, yes, it does. Now, then with that, we move into the next part. And really, like with the second one, this isn't something we're unfamiliar with. And really, of any part of the Easter Vigil, the liturgy of the Eucharist 
really goes along as it usually would. There's nothing that's going to come in here that's going to interrupt it or make it different from what you would have, like you have in all in the other three parts. So this is all flowing into the liturgy of the Eucharist. It's intended to be that way. It's intended really to be that way in a sense to certainly emphasize the spirit and what we are we're entering into. Mass has not been celebrated since Thursday night. So there really has been that long span where no Mass has been celebrated. The Eucharist is now celebrated. We celebrate in the spirit of, in the, spirit of the celebration of joy, the glory of the Lord's resurrection. All of this we bring to this in this celebration of the liturgy of the Eucharist at this time. So all of this, as I said, if you look at it like the movements of a symphony or anything like that, you're watching it really flow, flow one right into the other. And that's its purpose. If we're looking at it, well, how long is this going to take? How long is this going to take? How long is this going to take? You know, you're missing the whole point. You're cutting the whole thing up. It's got to be looked at as being it's one continuous flow and the liturgy is going to be seen in that spirit and when and it helps to have a greater appreciation for what takes place in this liturgy is there anything you feel that I needs to be covered a little more um, I you can tell I me mean, I didn't stand here and really read all these notes that I had here like I usually don't <laughs> Uh, because really, I think, was, well, Mike said it before, before we began tonight, was explaining to a friend, he says, you know, he said, for Father, he said, this is really second nature to him. He says, he probably can do it in his sleep, and I wonder if he is sleeping sometimes when he does it. <laughs> See, watch what you say. I never know when I might quote you. <laughs> so, I mean, well, yeah, that, that is true, but I mean, but I do like to have the notes there. Because sometimes you can get a little caught up and you're doing this and you forget something. But really, yes? No, yes, it is. It's yeah, all, all of that is done. This is not like the old ceremony, the old liturgy. You did that because it was closer to midnight when you did it. I mean, so the old liturgy of the Easter Vigil emphasized more of that. You changed the color of the vestments. They were, they were violet. They went to white. You know, you, you, know, you, did all, you took all the covers off the vest. The, everything that was covered, the only thing that was uncovered was the crucifix, because that was uncovered on Good Friday. But everything else, you know, you did all of that and you got it ready. With the, when this was simplified, they really emphasize more of the fact everything is ready, everything is there. The only thing that you notice when you, with this is the candles are not going to be lit. They will be lit at the time of the Gloria. So you're coming into a church where really the only light that is really used and emphasized is what you have in your hand. And then when the lights are turned on to do the liturgy of the word, well, okay, for the first part, you're not really talking about light, I mean, yes you are in one of the readings, creation, let there be light, but you're really not emphasizing that, but it gets more of an emphasis when you get to the Gloria, when you light the candles, and you, you know, now you've entered into the fullness of the spirit of this liturgy, and now, now you're, you're into it. So that's what the difference is with it, but everything is ready. The, the old liturgy Primarily, if you remembered, I mean, when you had the old liturgy, you, were you know, you were dealing with an altar that was facing, you know, the priest was facing this, had his back this way, and you were facing this way. And you, <clears throat> excuse me, so you were accustomed to this altar being all set up all the time. When the liturgy changed, this became much different. So all you have is this here. So you're not putting the offertory gifts on it. You're not doing any of that. The offertory gifts are still in another part of the church. You don't have this prepared at all. So, you know, this is why you can give it a different emphasis. You're using it only for the liturgy of the Eucharist. 
not the liturgy of the word, not anything else, only for that. And it's really true. Of all of these, all of these parts of this liturgy, you're only using the altar when you get here. It's not intended to be used for any other purpose than that. So then you set it up. Then you use it. Now, of course, keep in mind, okay, we are, at that point, we bring the gifts up, we prepare the gifts, we bless them. But there's one thing that could still be a holdover from the previous two days. What could that be? Tabernacle is empty. The tabernacle is empty. So what could that mean in regard to an empty tabernacle? Pardon, Joanne? If you still have, if you have not used all of the, sac the Eucharist, then it's going to be reposed somewhere. So one side or the other, whichever it may be. So at the time of communion, we bring that up here to the altar, should there be anything left. Then when, 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 when communion is over, then everything returns to the tabernacle. So, just, like I said, one other, one other little item in there that we have, I mean, that you, you do that, that's when the tabernacle return, you know, that's when we return to reposing the Blessed Sacrament in the tabernacle. With that, then, you are coming to the conclusion of the liturgy. The one exception in the, lit in the conclusion of the liturgy at the Easter Vigil and then it will be true for the conclusion of the liturgies on Easter Sunday, will be when we come to the dismissal, the Mass is ended, go in peace, Alleluia, Alleluia, thanks be to God, Alleluia, Alleluia. Okay, so the Alleluias are repeated. It will be like that in Easter and probably even into the week of Easter, until the, into the following weekend, when we have the second, which is the second Sunday of Easter, uh, that we would use, that still be, we would do that. Now, eventually, that will return at the conclusion of the Easter season, which is marked by what day? Pentecost. Pentecost. At Pentecost, that is, will be the conclusion, and then we will, dis the dismissal will have those alleluias in it once again. So, Easter marks a 50-day celebration that will take place until we come to Pentecost. Questions? I have a question about the Gloria. The Gloria, other than Advent and Lent, is part of the introductory rites. But on this night, it's part of the liturgy of the Word. Mm-hmm. Can you think of a reason for that? I mean, why wouldn't it be before the liturgy of the word, like it always is? There's no penitential rite. Okay. That only will that will occur on Easter Sunday, but it was not part of the it's not part of this liturgy. It might. I don't. I don't really know if I would. I mean, it may, but I mean, I would really look at it in the fact being that you have no penitential right. The glory is usually a part of that, you know. And then, but what you're doing in this case is you're putting it in there because you're working through a sequence which you do mention with the Old Testament readings. What they lead to, the glory, of course, would be something that would see really seem to have a more of a New Testament theme to it. Um, but, and that would be, the other way I would say, that would be following the sequence of what it is, because when you get to Easter Sunday, where does the first reading usually come from? The Acts of the Apostles. From the Acts of the Apostles. 
So you're into the New Testament. You don't go back to the Old Testament until you have really left the Easter season. So you, you have that spirit then of living, you know, everything is proclaimed in the spirit of the New Testament right through the Easter season, even our funeral liturgies. When, you know, when, when people, people, it's a funeral during, the, during Easter. Usually you are selecting a reading from the New Testament. It's usually from the Acts of the Apostles or the Book of Revelation is your first reading. So it, that New Testament theme carries through all, all the way. And, and, and the Gloria is kind of inserted into that, in that place within it. Now, like I said, only for this liturgy because then it's back in the place where it usually is for the others. Any other questions? For a year like this year with us, where we, we're not baptizing or confirming anybody, other than the litany of the saints, and other, obviously the water baptism and confirmation rites, what else is omitted? That's it. That's the only thing omitted? Yeah, because you would be, you would bless the water. Now, whether you bless the font is another question, but everything else, as I'm thinking about it, you would, uh, what you would do, like I said, the litany would not be done. You would not be doing any instruction or any, any address to the, anybody being baptized. There would be no baptism, there would be no baptism, there would be no light presenting a candle, uh, presenting a new garment, none of that would be taking place. It would just be what you would do for to be able to renew baptism promises. So you would have to bless the water and have that available and then renew the promises and then after the promises sprinkle people with the holy water. Mm -hmm. That is done at the beginning of every, everyone besides the ministers receiving communion. That is done first. As much as possible. As much as possible. Okay. Right. You, know, you would do that. I mean, I mean, it really just kind of blends. You know, they come up, they receive. You know, uh, there's nothing. That, that's not like. They're not like they come up and then everybody else, we invite everybody else up. They come up because they would probably be seated up in front anyway. Because they would be coming out of their seats into the sanctuary to be baptized, to be confirmed. Then at the end of that, of all of that liturgy of the bapt of baptism, then they would return to their seats. Then we would have the universal prayer, the prayers of intercession before we go into the liturgy of the Eucharist. So we would, the people would have returned to their places before we do the intercessions. I just have to think for a minute, yes. Okay. <clears throat> yes. I don't know about that. Uh, I'm not sure about that one. I'm a little more... Um, I, I would have to check on that. I'm not positive about that one. Because I know they usually try to encourage as much as possible in the, at the vigil to do it. Because, I mean, there's specific reference made to that about the, um, you know, if there were infants then this is what you do. And whereas as compared to adults, you don't, you're not confirming an infant. You're not in the Rome, not in the, let's put it this way, not in the tradition of the Roman rite. Just baptism. Not baptism. Not like say for an adult, but if you had a baby that the family wanted to say they wanted to have the baby baptized on Easter Sunday as part of the Mass. Is that in the, is that in the 
um, considered okay to be doing. I know you can receive uh, baptism at a mass right. any, time, any, mm -hmm. any Sunday. But is that within the right that that should be done if it could be done? I would have to check on that. All right. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what they do when they come to Easter Sunday. I mean, there are, you have the purists who will turn around and say, you know, you only do it at this time. But to say that is that pastorally the way you would do it, I need to check that to see. I couldn't see, my, I might personally, I, mean, I wouldn't see a reason why not, but I've never done it, so I'm not sure about that. Anyone else? Okay, because we're not quite done. If you recall the first night when we did, we're doing uh, <clears throat> Holy Thursday, I made quite a few references to, and it was made, actually made reference to again tonight, but not probably in exactly the same way, about how Holy Thursday, the Last Supper, is really celebrated as a celebration of Passover. Because you were dealing, you know, because Jesus, the apostles, and all the people who gathered with him that night were all of Jewish background. They would have celebrated Passover. <clears throat> At last, uh, within the last, I don't know, 10 days, I attended a, con attended a the gathering that Bishop McManus had from the priests, dealing with the mystery of the Eucharist and the life of the church. It's the document that they've put out that, for those of you who may have taken part in some of the synodal gatherings, there were three parts to it, and the second part deals with that. There's really a heavy emphasis on the part of the bishops to really push emphasizing the Eucharist and its place in the life of the church, so much so that it's going to, over, it's going to have this over a three-year period. I had the occasion to get the, find the document of the mystery of the Eucharist and the life of the church that the bishops put out, and I was very, <laughs> it was kind of humorous when Bishop McManus said, it's one of the shortest documents that the bishops in the United States have ever put out. Not because of its subject matter. I think probably probably I think what they were looking for was to be sure of its readability, um, that it would be read. And I think they kept it probably in as concise terms, I'm not going to say simple, concise terms as possible. When I was reading this document, it was interesting that there are some things that are emphasized in here that go back to Holy Thursday. So what I did was, and I'll give you all a copy of it, there are excerpts that I took from that document that deal with Holy Thursday and the Passover meal. Joanne, you'll have to get that from me. Okay? <laughs> and what I want to just take a few moments to emphasize, and for this, I will probably do this more by reading You will see that there are five paragraphs that I quote, that, are, that, I, that I took, where particularly it was mentioned about Holy Thursday, the Lord's Supper, Passover, and, okay, and then what that leads into, which I'll get into in a moment. First of all, the document is split up into a couple of different, different major sections the gift, and then our response or our participation in it. But in the heading, un under, the, under the heading of the gift, you see in the first paragraph that I use, paragraph 8, it says that the Mass of the Lord's Supper, celebrated on Holy Thursday, the priest prays this wor these words, okay? For he is the true and eternal priest who instituted the pattern of, of an everlasting sacrifice, and was the first to offer himself as the saving victim, commanding us to make this offering as his memorial. 
So as we eat his flesh that was sacrificed for us, we are made strong. As we drink his blood that was poured out for us, we are washed clean. So it says, the words of the liturgy on, the, on that night, the church commemorates the institution of the Eucharist. They speak to us of the Mass as the representation of Christ's unique sacrifice on the cross. Very important to keep that in mind because I think I mentioned something about that, that we remember that this is the representation, not just meant to be something that seems like it, but the representation, which is really talking about it's emphasizing its connection with, the, with Christ when he first did this at the Last Supper, certainly looking at himself, comparing himself to the, the Paschal Lamb. The next part it goes into the sacrifice of Christ. Okay, so it's going to elaborate on that a little more. At the Last Supper, celebrating the Passover, Jesus makes explicit that his impending death, freely embraced out of love, is sacrificial. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, he said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. In the words and gestures of the Last Supper, Jesus makes it clear that out of love for us, he is freely offering his life for the forgiveness of our sins. In doing so, he is both the priest offering a sacrifice and the victim being offered. As priest, Jesus is offering a sacrifice to God the Father, an offering prefigured by the offering of bread and wine by Melchizedek, priest of the God Most High, as witnessed and spoken of in Genesis, in the Psalms, and even mentioned in the book letter to the Hebrews. Anticipating his passion is in the institution of the Eucharist, Christ has indicated the forms under which his self-offering will be sacramentally present to us until the end of time. So, anybody who is thinking that this is a symbol, it's very clear it's not. It is very much that what, what Christ himself said, this is, how you will, this is how you're going to remember me, this is how you're going to know what my offering is all about, it's going to continue to be celebrated. And every time that you do that, I am him in your midst. I am present to you. And present in the bread and wine offered up that becomes through the words of institution, his body and blood. It goes on, because of course this, these, these paragraphs are all linked together. What is so important that we understand, why is it so important that we understand the Eucharist is a sacrifice? is because that all that Jesus did for the salvation of humanity is made present in the celebration of the Eucharist, including his sacrificial death and resurrection. Christ's sacrifice of himself to the Father was efficacious and salvific because of the supreme love which he shed, with which he shed his blood, the price of our salvation, and offered himself to the Father on our behalf. His blood shed for us is the eternal sign of that love. As a memorial, the Eucharist is not another sacrifice, but the representation of the sacrifice of Christ by which we are reconciled to the Father. It is the way by which we are drawn into Christ's perfect offering of love so that his sacrifice becomes the sacrifice of the church. So it's very clear that this is what certainly has been the church's intention. This is what the bishops are reiterating, and it's important for us to certainly Keep, you know, to, re to keep this in mind, which I'm sure we certainly do, but is to also know why and how and how it links to what we particularly make note of when we celebrate the tr Triduum, not just with Holy Thursday, because that seems to be where the most direct emphasis is on it, but how it continues to flow if we're keeping in mind the Triduum is seen as one event. And if that one event is there, then everything is occurring is just is flowing right through everything. It's either prefigured or it flows right through. And that's what's important to bear in mind. The Eucharist draws us into Jesus' act of self-oblation more than just statically receiving the incarnate logos, or word, we enter into the very dynamic of his self-giving. 
So Jesus' intention is that certainly we enter into this, just like we enter into this, just like we enter into everything of the Triduum. Really what we are doing in the Triduum is only reminding us of what we should be doing all the time. We enter into this completely in spirit so that we are connected with Christ, we are connected with God, we're connected with the Trinity in all that we do by way of what we say that we do when we worship. So it's important to see that the Eucharist is a sacrificial meal. It's one of the things that they, want to em- they wanted to emphasize in this. We can sometimes say the Eucharist is a sacrifice, the Eucharist is a meal. No, put the two of them together. Because what we have found out in the past is that, yes, we can refer to one or the other as long as, long as we're keeping it in the context of both. But if we emphasize one, we're risking it being one over the other. And then what we have is something that goes to extremes. And at one time we had the extreme of Eucharist being a sacrifice. And then we went to another extreme of Eucharist being a meal. And what kind of got lost along the way was, what really is the Eucharist? The Eucharist is meant to be a sacrificial meal. What does that mean? Who is that pointing toward? It's not pointing toward us. It's pointing toward us, you, you know, Christ united with us, and Christ desiring to be one with us. And that is what is what's celebrated in the Eucharist. So we find that, you know, when they talked about the Passover, you know, you got there in, in, in paragraph 15 what they did. Of course, we've all prepared with the custom of what the Israelites did prior to their flight from Egypt. They were marked as a people set apart and chosen by God as his special possession, which is something that's re-emphasized in Eucharist. We are God's special possession. That means that God was present to his people then. God is even more so present to us in the Eucharist. So we're not just, this is not some past event. It's a present event, and really, it's, it's forever present. God never makes anything past, and <clears throat> he keeps that in terms of what is truly present. Um, okay, I'm just going to go down to number 16. The saving work of Jesus Christ, which was brought to fulfillment, brought to fulfillment was announced in the figure in, figure in the Passover. It is now represented in the celebration of the Eucharist. The Eucharist makes present the one sacrifice of Christ the Savior. As Pope St. John Paul II taught, the church constantly draws her life from this redeeming sacrifice. She approaches it not only through faith-filled remembrance, but also through a real contact. Since this sacrifice is made present ever anew, sacramentally perpetuated in every community which offers it at the hands of a consecrated minister. So it's just something to, like I said, I just wanted to share with you in regard to this and what also really it takes a particular emphasis when we celebrate the liturgy of Holy Thursday and as it carries into Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter. Any questions? I mean the I mean I this is the this is the document. I just took I printed I printed it out. It's it's 35 pages, but it's double spaced. So it's not exactly what you're going to call this little t- condensed print that's probably font eight that you're trying to read. It's much it's a little bigger than that. But <clears throat> uh, it really did kind of, like I said, it was an e- I considered it to be an easy read because compared to some of the documents I've seen the bishops put out, you have to read it and then you've got to put it down. This really was kind of, this really kind of flowed along. But there will be more mentioned about this in, in, as time goes along. But I just thought it was particularly interesting where I had you know, spoken the first week about the Eucharist, the Seder meal, you know, the Passover, the symbolism, you know, what you bring with, with that, that it would be good to probably just highlight the fact that some of the paragraphs in this document 
emphasize that. So that was kind of like my postlude for tonight to work that in. Any questions, thoughts, comments? It's been great. Thank you. Yeah, because guess what? I think we're now at about 10 after 8. I think. Because again, I'm looking at that clock through those, with those lights shining on it, so I'm guessing that it's 10 minutes after 8. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I hope that this will certainly help. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm sure certainly that you very well much appreciate and are enriched by the liturgies that we celebrate in the Triduum. I hope that this might give it even a little more of that. I just felt it was a good idea to do it because of the fact in the past two years we've had to do abbreviated versions of all of this because of COVID. Where we're now turning to what we would remember before that and I think it's always good to do a refresher on that to remember why we have these ceremonies and most especially why they are important. Because, I mean, they're not, I mean, none of them are considered to be well, probably, maybe the vigil, but you're not, they're not considered to be obligations. But hopefully, people would take part in them because they would see them as being important to who we are as a people and who we profess that we are. So, I thank you very much.